Hey, it's so good to be here. Um, yeah, it's been a long time coming. Yeah. Uh, your pastor's been asking me uh, for goodness at least a year and a half. And, and, a half. and for some reason or another, I, I just never could make it. But here I am. No excuses tonight, Pastor. Come on. Um, you moved here. You couldn't get away. <laughs> you know where I live. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank everyone. Um, you know, I love music, I love to sing, but I don't really have a good voice, and, and sometimes I'm a little bit shy, and, you know, I sing real low, and, and we would joke about it growing up, you know, we'd sing solo, solo, you can't, you know, hear me, and, and this is probably one of the churches, the, the few churches that, that's just so loud and crazy, you know, I can sing at the top of my voice, and no one can hear me, and, and so I love it, so thank you for that, um, thank you very much, um, but really, it's, it's an honor to be here, and and I'm sorry I put it off for so long. Uh, I want to start in, in Joshua uh, chapter 9. It's a, it's, a, it's a long text, so I'm going to summarize uh, some of it. There. <laughs> With the Bible on earth. And, and a lot of us may be familiar with this, with this story and with this text. Uh, you know, Joshua, he just came out of Jericho and decimated Jericho and... AI, and here he is, and and he comes upon the people of the, the Gibeonites, and uh, it's funny, I know in my Bible it has a little little uh, head note there, and it says uh, the deception of the Gibeonites, that's what they'll always be known for, they'll go down in history, uh, the people that deceived Joshua, um, and, and they did a very, very clever thing, uh, a very, very, very clever thing. Uh, they, they knew that utter destruction was, was at their door, and they were desperate, if you will. Uh, what they did, they sent some ambassadors to Joshua and his army, and they had dressed up in these old clothes, these worn shoes, and had these old wineskins that were cracked. Uh, they had old, dried, moldy bread, and, and so it was like a show they put on for Joshua. They said, listen, we're from far away. Will you please make a treaty with us? See, Joshua was, was ordered to go into this land and take it, right? Yeah, yeah. He didn't go and say, hey, can I please have it? They took it by force, Amen. right? And so these people were terrified. Amen. And so they were trying to win some favor with Joshua. And so Joshua and his leaders, they fell right into their little trap, if you will. Uh, he, he didn't ask a whole lot of questions. He just uh, said, well, how do I know that? You're from a distant land. And they whipped out the moldy bread. Well, look, when we left, this was fresh. Look how old it is. When we left, our shoes and sandals were new. And look how worn they are. And our wineskins, they were fresh and new. And, and now they're all worn and cracked. And so that was good enough for Joshua. They said, fine, okay. They shook hands and the deal was sealed. And uh, I want to start reading in, in verse 22. Joshua called together the Gibeonites and said, Why did you lie to us? Why did you say that you live in a distant land when you live right here among us? May you be cursed. From now on you will always be servants who cut wood and carry water for the house of my God. They replied, We did it because we, your servants, were clearly told that the Lord your God commanded his servant Moses to give you this entire land and to destroy all the people living in it. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you. That is why we have done this. Now we are at your mercy. Do to us whatever you think is right. So Joshua did not allow the people of Israel to kill them. But that day he made the Gibeonites the woodcutters and water carriers for the community of Israel and for the altar of the Lord, wherever the Lord would choose to build it. And that is what they do to this day. Now, I want to just pause here just for a little bit and just tell you a little bit about myself. And uh, it, it just, there's just so much stuff up here. It just, I, I just pray that God would just give me the words and uh, just anoint my mouth. And, and it's just for his glory tonight. Uh, you know, I was raised in the church. Many of you might have been raised in church, right? Amen. Amen. I think being raised in church is a good thing. I, I long to see kids that have never been stained and, and, and polluted by the world, that have just been raised in the house of God. I think that's a wonderful thing. Uh, but I, I didn't, 
I didn't go that route. Uh, I grew up in church and spent most of my childhood in church. And uh, the only problem was, just like we see today, I was just like every other Christian that, that I knew, right? You judge yourself by other Christians, and you're fine. Everything's okay. That's right. mm -hmm. But that's the danger that I see today. And, I, and I, I made it through high school. <laughs> and when I got out of high school, I began to uh, drink and party and, and that whole thing. And it was a terrible thing. Uh, you know, we all as, as people just have a void and we're just looking. I, I was just looking for an escape, if you will. Uh, just looking for something just to take my, you know, my mind. When At night when I would lay down, I would just always begin to contemplate the deep things. And, you know, I didn't feel right. I was uneasy. And so I would always cover up with, with different things, you know, being around people and, and trying to feel differently than I felt. And, and so uh, one thing led to another as I began to just hang out with the wrong group of people. Uh, I just fit so... <laughs> I just slid right into that group of people of just partying and drinking. And, and I tell you, it was, it was a, a fateful night one night that someone introduced me to, to cocaine. and It rocked my world. It did a terrible thing to me. And uh, it left most of my adult life just in pieces. Uh, I was strung out on cocaine for probably the better part of my adult life. And... Uh, you know, the, the, the trap of the enemy is so real. You know, it just starts out slowly, you know. I never planned as a young person, you know, that, that I'm going to destroy my life with drugs and crime. I, I never, I never dreamed that, not in a million years. But it's just, just one thing led to another. You know, the compounding effect of sin. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another in uh, 1995. I was 21 years old. And uh, I was sitting in jail. I'd just been arrested for robbery and burglary, two uh, first-degree felonies. I was looking at some serious time. Uh, and so I didn't know what to, to do. I'm just laying in jail. And, you know, of course, I I'd wronged all my friends. I'd wronged my family. And, and so no one was there for me. Uh, I was uh, appointed a, a a court uh, appointed attorney and, and he did his best for me and, and uh, it was my first uh, offense offenses you know basically and and they really went kind of light on me they gave me probation they gave me two 10-year sentences of probation 20 years of probation you know I, <laughs> I look at that a whole lot differently today <laughs> at the time but all I knew is hey sign this paper and you walk and uh, I didn't quite know what I was getting into but when, when you're on probation, you know, you have the long arm of the law, you know, just right there in your business. And they want to know that you're supposed to be at certain places at certain times. You have curfews, uh, no drugs, no alcohol. You can't hang around other convicted felons. All these rules. Okay. And let me tell you, I hated jail. I hated the consequences of the things that I did. But I, I wasn't ready to change. I wasn't ready to do things differently. I just was... You know, maybe a little saddened that I'd gotten caught and that I was, you know, having to try to abide by all these rules that they were telling me. Unfortunately, I, I just, it just was not in me. I just could not stay clean. I, I just couldn't. I mean, I couldn't if I tried. You know, probably, I think it was probably about three years of just going, you know, in and out of jail. You know, you get in trouble with probation, they put you in jail. There's three years of just in and out, in and out, in and out. And I couldn't do right for the life of me. I just couldn't. It just wasn't in me. And uh, uh, it didn't take a real long time to figure out that, you know, I wasn't going to make this 10 years probation. And so the, the, the catch of probation is that if you fail, right, if you don't comply and you violate your probation, no matter how long you've been on probation, they will send you to prison for that duration, which in my case was 20 years. So I was looking at some serious consequences, but yet I was into some things that I just could not leave alone. And so as things begin to get worse and worse, and, and, and they, they pretty much just told me where I was headed, right? They told me, this is, you continue this behavior, you're going to go to prison. 
And uh, today I look back and I don't even, I can't even hardly reason with you why I did the things I did. But at the time, uh, it made the most sense. You know, when you get in trouble, the heat is on. Sometimes you, you do the, the one thing you, you all you just, you run, right? Let's get out of here. <laughs> and so that's what I did. I realized, you know, I didn't want to be in prison, right? A clean cut, you know, blue eyed, blue hair, blonde hair doesn't need to be in prison. Uh, I valued my freedom. And so I left. I packed a bag and I jumped on the bus that I could find that was going the feathers. Like I said, this is just, you know, sporadic thinking. You know, I'm not really thinking this through very well, but all I know is I couldn't stay where I was at. I had to get out of the situation. It's funny how, how we think that if we just change our environment, you know, everything will be okay. Um, well, I ended up in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, I spent a, a number of years there. And uh, I, I, I wish I could tell you I did better. <laughs> I wish I could tell you that everything went well. And, and uh, I look back in happy memories in St. Louis, but no, it wasn't that way. You know what? I fell right back in to the same thing that I ran away from. <laughs> Got right back into drugs, you know, uh, except worse. You know, in South Texas, you know, you've got cocaine, you have all these things up north. It's meth. You know, the doctors are saying that meth is, is, uh, is worse than, uh, than heroin. You know, I, I come to find out that it, it's it's the worst kind of drug that you'd want to experiment with and get involved in. And so anyway, I was right there in the middle of that. And uh, so basically, instead of making my life better, it got worse. It progressively got worse and worse. And I fell into this mindset that, well, things can't get any worse. You know how, how people say that? Well, you know, I'm at rock bottom, so things are going to turn around. You know, that's just wrong. That's just wrong thinking because you have an enemy. That's right. You have a devil, and his one plan is not to make you, you know, miserable. It's not to put you in prison. It's not to make you a drug addict, but it's to kill you. That's it's right. take the life of God right out of you. That's it. Okay, and he's never going to stop until you're dead. That's right. You know what? My life got worse and worse and worse and worse, and it did not look like it was ever going to stop. And so here I was in St. Louis, Missouri, a hundred times worse than I was in Texas. You know, the very thing that I was running from, prison, right? I, I didn't want to be confined. I didn't want to be, you know, in a, in, a, in a small cell and people telling me what to do and how to do it. And so that's what I was running from in my head. That's what I was, you know, running from. And, but what I came to find out was, I looked around me in, in St. Louis and, and I had built prison bars all around me. And I realized, you know, how, how stupid, how stupid that was. St. Louis, Missouri. Got into some real pickles there. <laughs> uh, one night I caught my kitchen on fire cooking that. That was a real eye opener. You know? I, uh, <laughs> It was that night that I, that, that I really began to realize that I had sunk to an all-time low, that I'd gone to a place that I never wanted to go. I was so far out there, I didn't know how I was ever going to get back. And see, that's just an enemy plot, just straight from hell. He's going to try to separate you so that you feel hopeless and that you can't get back. And that's exactly where I felt. My life was so complicated. I didn't know how I could ever get back. I honestly did not. And so uh, at that point, I, I really was beginning to, to question things and maybe begin to ponder and, and think of maybe how I could do things differently and maybe some of my options. And, but it was always a very short you know, conversation in my head because I didn't have a lot of options. You know, I was so far out there. When I left, I left Texas with the bag on my back and I turned my back on my family, my friends. I didn't call them. I didn't tell them where I was. As far as they knew, I was dead. I was gone for almost six years. And so there I was in St. Louis, pretty much 
destitute at one point. Uh, you know, I had people that were looking to harm me. I didn't have a roof over my head. It's funny how sometimes at moments like these, you finally begin to think, okay, God, <laughs> what do I do now? What do I do now? And I remember a, uh, a, a story that a, that a pastor had told, and I so love this story. You might have seen it. It's on YouTube. And, and uh, he tells his story of a, it's a mother and a daughter. They live outside of a, a large city, and this daughter is very beautiful, and, and the mother is, is, is scared that one day she's going to lose her daughter. The daughter's going to run off to the big city and, and become God knows what. And so sure enough, one day mom comes home and the daughter left a note and said, Mom, I've left to go find uh, my riches in da 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 city. And so this woman was distraught, as, as you can imagine. And what she did, she went to the city and she went to a photo booth and, and, and gathered a bunch of pictures, a bunch of photos of herself. And she went to all the, the bars and, and all the... Uh, the nightclubs and, and the hotels and she would put her picture up and eventually she ran out of money, she came back. And then one night the daughter who'd become a prostitute and was down and out and just had gotten exactly, you know, where her mama had, had feared. And, and so one night uh, in a hotel at the mirror, she saw the picture of her mother mm -hmm. and she picked it up and she turned it over and on the back of it, her mom had written, I don't care who you've become. I don't care what you've done. Just come home. Mm -hmm. And you know, that is such a powerful story because, you know, that is the story in God's word. From the Old Testament mm. to the New Testament to the end. It's, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've become. Just come home. And as God began to draw me, you know, I just can think in my heart. And, and it, it was so complicated. But in my head, it was just simple. It was just, I got to get home. <laughs> I need to come home. I need to make things right in my life and, and whatever it takes. And so as I begin to process all this, okay, now how am I going to make that happen? And, and it's just funny how looking back, I see God just orchestrating and opening doors and, and just providence in my life. And uh, the only person that I could think of, uh, I couldn't reach out to my family, right? I'd shut the, the door on, the, on them for, you know, the better part of six years, you know, uh, I don't think they were in my corner anymore. I forget the friends I ever had. Uh, the only person that I knew that I could think of, it was a pastor, and he had reached out to my, my, my brother in some of the same problems. And, and so uh, I didn't even really know him that well. He didn't really know me. I'm sure he'd heard of me, and he knew who I was. I'm sure he didn't want to have anything to do with me, you know. Uh, but I called him, and, uh, and uh, I, I didn't... You know, realize it, but he goes to bed super early, and I always call real late at night. You know, so I would, I kept missing him. You know, and and finally, uh, someone answered her. I think it was, I think it was his wife, and and I, I told her who I was, and she's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, this, I'm trying to get a hold of your uh, your husband. I need to talk to him. And so I, I don't even remember all the details how we finally got on the phone and. I think she coordinated us a time to call it. Anyway, I got this pastor on the phone, and and I'm just going for broke here. You know, I got nothing to lose. And I'm like, Pastor, I said, I'm way out here. My life's a mess, and I don't even know what to do. I just want to come home. Is there any way you can help me? And uh, and like a pastor does, they said, yeah, come on. He said, come on. And so I did. I got on a plane and, and, and left that mess, and and, and came back home to Texas and and uh, and thank God for this pastor and uh, he had the the foresight and enough uh, wisdom to he took me into his home and and then we began just sorting through the pieces. I mean, what a mess! What a mess! What a what! I mean, the legal problems. I mean, you know, I had a had a had a daughter. I, you know, I hadn't spoken to in years. You know, uh, my I had lost a brother when I was gone. Uh, my twin brother was killed in a car accident during this time frame. Uh, you know, I just had so many broken pieces. And, uh, and so we just sat down at the kitchen table so many nights. And, and I was like, Pastor, I don't even know what to do. I mean, how do we do this? And, 
And so little by little, step by step, we would just tackle one little thing. And I remember that's what he'd always tell me. It's just, just let's just look at this thing right now. Let's just let's forget all that other stuff. Because things like that can be very overwhelming. When you, you're in a big mess, sometimes you just got to take baby steps. Just one step after another. Okay, today I'm going to live for God. I don't care about yesterday. I don't care about tomorrow. But today I am going to live for God. Amen. And sometimes that's all it takes. And so I live day by day by day for a little while. Uh, and, and this pastor friend, he, uh, he had some good contacts, okay? Uh, he had some contacts in, uh, in the judicial system. Uh, he had a good judge, a uh, good friend judge. And so we sat down at breakfast and had talk, powwows with this, this judge and lawyers. And we'd sit and visit, you know, and... And, uh, and just, just lay it all out there. You know, we're trying to understand, you know, what the best, you know, way to, to handle this. And because basically when I came back, you know, basically 20 years, I mean, let's, let's not miss this. I mean, this is not, this is not Chump James. This is not a little, this is serious stuff, you know, 20 years. And so uh, we sat and visited, you know, trying to uh, figure out what the best course of action was. And and, and you know what, both this lawyer, Christian lawyer and Christian judge, the best they could come up with this is we think you should just go back. <laughs> okay, and that was a dose of reality because sometimes in our head we fantasize if we just, if we just try to do the right thing, everything's going to work out, right? Mm -hmm. Right, we think that. And so in the back of my mind, I, you know, I, I, I knew reality said I'm looking at 20 years, but I was just hoping, you know, I'm throwing myself you know, God's mercy, and I'm just hoping this is all going to work out. Well, <laughs> you know, a local lawyer and a local judge, the best they can say is, yeah, you're looking at some serious time. The, the best advice that we give to you is, you know, maybe you should just go back, you know, just continue. You know, you've been gone for so long. It worked for you. And, uh, of course, that was no advice for me. I mean, that's not what I came back home for. I wanted to make things right. And, and in my heart, I didn't care what the cost was. So anyway, we had some, you know, serious things to ponder and, and pray over, you know. And, uh, and I love how God just works things out. <laughs> Sometimes we sit and pray about things and, and we don't know what to do, but God just, he just makes things happen. And so, uh, of course, I was a fugitive, you know, I was, I was a wanted man. I was actually, uh, they were actually running, you know, on the news and newspaper. I mean, they, they were, they were, they were actively pursuing me and um, and so as we're trying to figure out what to do uh, I actually got arrested someone recognized me and threw me in jail and so I love stuff like that because see I had a very complicated situation and God made it real simple because <laughs> I'm thinking do we do this or do we do this and God says, how about this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he limited my choices. And he says, okay, you're just going to go in and you're just going to take this just right on. And I said, all right, good. Because that's kind of what I was ready to do anyway. Uh, I'll just try to make some complicated stuff. You know how courts in our system, it's, it's, it's a big machine. I, I, I wish I could tell you it's. It's a good thing, but I, I don't know what to tell you about it. <laughs> the one thing I knew when I came down, it was going to take money. I, 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 brought, I brought some money with me to hire a lawyer, and uh, so we obtained a, uh, we obtained a lawyer, and uh, yeah, this guy, it's funny. It's funny how things work. This was my lawyer, like... 10 years ago and uh, anyway this guy he's working with me and not just me but he's working with a pastor I don't think he's ever done anything quite like that before because if you know pastors believers they walk just a little bit differently they act like they maybe see things that normal people don't see uh, the lawyer is telling me uh, we've talked to the DA, and this is what they're going to do. They're going to make an example out of you. Uh, you know, you've made a laughing stock of our system, and here's what we're going to do. You deserve 20, but if you sign right now, right now, I mean right now, 
we'll give you 10 years. If you don't sign right now, if you if you want to see the judge, you want to pursue this any further, we're going to give you 20. So I'm looking at 10 or 20 years. I mean, neither one of them sounded real nice. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, I was ready to sign. I mean, it, it wasn't something I was looking forward to, but I'm not a real genius here, but 10 or 20 is pretty simple, right? This is the court system saying 10 now or 20 later. And so I said, I mean, I came down here and, and God, whatever it takes, if this is what I have to do, and let's do it. And, you know, I, it's just me and my lawyer at the table. And, and, and the pastor is just a little ways away. And, and apparently he sees me with the pin in my head. And he's like, no, don't sign it. And so I'm thinking, what? I, I'm thinking maybe he doesn't understand. They're telling me now or, or 20. And so I'm thinking, man. You know, because this whole deal is going down right now. And so I'm just like, okay. You know, the pastor seems real confident. He's like authoritatively saying, do not sign it. And I'm just like, hey, I didn't sign it, by the way. <laughs> We've had some meetings with this lawyer. And he basically said, hey, listen, there's really nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. I'm a twice convicted felon. They actually had a third felony they were trying to charge me with. In the state of Texas, you know, strike three, you go home for life. And oh, so man. this is some serious business. And the lawyer's putting all this in perspective for me and the pastor. And he's saying, listen, there are no options here. And the pastor, his tone was entirely different. The pastor just said, listen here, lawyer. I know more than you do and we're going to have our day in court and I was like we are <laughs> I want you to know my mom when she heard about this she was I mean mama loves me right mama loves me she, she, she wants the best for me she doesn't like 10 years but she really hates 20 years and she called you know this pastor and says what are you trying to do to my boy you're going to give him more time and the whole time the pastor, thank God, is, is not listening to the facts. Thank God the pastor is not looking at what he can see, but apparently he knows something that I don't know. And the only thing I remember in all of this that he kept telling me was, you just got to believe. You just got to believe. And, and it's, it seems so stupid at the time, you know, when you're sitting in a, in, in a jam like that with, with just, you don't see any, you can't see. And you have this guy sitting in front of you just saying, hey, just believe, just believe. And I, I just said, all right, all right, I, I will. I'm just going to trust you. I'm just going to believe and, and just let's, let's just whatever. And that's what we did. That's what we did. We de were determined to have our day in court. And we went uh, the day of our, our hearing. And so the lawyer's sitting down with me and the pastor. He's like, okay. Just so y'all know, there is no defense. I didn't prepare anything. I got nothing. What do y'all want to do? And the pastor says, well, okay, listen here. This is what we're going to do. He's guilty, right? We all know that. There's nothing to argue. He's guilty as sin. He says, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to go up there and acknowledge guilty. Guilty. That was me. I did that. But here's where it changes from most people is, hey, Your Honor, I'm just begging for your mercy. Amen. Wow. <laughs> I'm not the same person that I was, and all I can do is ask for mercy. <laughs> of course, you know, from the perspective of law and order and all those things, that is the stupidest thing <laughs> the lawyer had ever heard. Yeah, I'll bet. And that's what we did. I went there and got on the stand. And it, it, it's, it's, it's horrible. And they read off everything. I mean, they have everything documented since I was 18 years old. And they, they read everything off and, and they present their case. And it's horrible. It's bad. 
And all I could do is sit there and agree, yes, that's true. Yes, I did that. <laughs> yes, that was me. And at the end of it, you know, they ask you, okay, well, what do you have to say for yourself? And <laughs> it's a real short story, but all I can tell them is, <laughs> I am so sorry. I, I'm just not that person anymore. I, I, today I follow God and, and I'm working to be made into an image of his son. And, you know, this time I, you know, because this the, the the DA, and this time I, I looked right, just eyeball to eyeball with the judge, and just said, "Sir, I, I just, I just beg for mercy. That's all I could do." And so they convened, and, and we came back, and you know, we went back before the judge, and you know, he started to read off the sentence, and. And uh, he started off, and, and that's the only thing I really remember was that he said, uh, you know, I hereby remand you uh, for eight years. That's all I heard was eight years. And I just, I was, you know, I was done. I, that's all I heard. And, and then I, I remember just a few moments later, the judge, you know, they, they talk and all this, this jargon, and I, I wasn't really making a lot of sense of it, but at some point, the, my lawyer, he kind of nudged me a little bit. And I was like, what? This can be eight years. And he says, that's it right there. That's it. We got it. And I was like, ah, I didn't understand what he was talking about. <coughs> and somehow God had, God, he did something in that judge because that same day, my, my court hearing was later in the afternoon, but I was there the whole day, right? And I watched one after another go before this judge. I'd been before this judge three times. Already. Three times I'd been before him. And there was three cases before mine that were very similar. Violation of probation. And they presented some good arguments. <laughs> I mean, some serious doubt. And all of them, ten years, ten years. Sir, you should have thought about that then. It's too late now. <laughs> and so those are the things that are going through my mind. And so when he came back and he told me eight years, and then the lawyers almost a little bit giddy with me, and yeah. we got to wait till all the proceedings are over. And and so then you know when, when everything's over, then the lawyer can talk to me, and he says he says you're not going to believe this. He says I've never seen this before. <laughs> he says there is a law that allows the judge jurisdiction over a person for six months. Okay, so he had given me eight years, but what he did was he set another court date at six months, and he was going to bring me back. Hmm. And the stipulation was, I just keep my nose clean. I was going to have to do a little time, but I just stay out of trouble. I never understood that. You know, they tell you to go to prison, but don't get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that was what they told me and whatever it was I agreed to <laughs> and uh, so when it was fully explained to me I got six months the judge gave me six months with some stipulations there, there was a bunch of other fine print and you know I didn't get off scot-free this judge was a fair judge all the years that I absconded he's going to make me do probation wise you know after six months he was going to he was going to put that all the money that I owed. He was going to make, make me pay restitution to the people and, and uh, all these. I mean, he was very exact. But he was a very fair judge. And so basically, he gave me that. He gave me that mercy. So I was in, you know, I was in prison for six months. And... Um, it was, it was a very good time. I wish I could tell you it was miserable, but it really wasn't. It was, it, it was, it was a wonderful time just to get into his word and, Amen. and just to pray. And Because I had a lot of things still to work out, right? I, I was just granted my freedom, but trust me, there were so many other things that still had to be worked out. And, and so I was just shut off from everything and everybody for six months. And I was able just to just to get into his word and, and, and just to learn to hear his voice again. And God. So 
So it was a good time. And, you know, I, it's easy to say, I've done this all my whole life. You know, you, you, you make a mistake and there's consequences hanging over your head and you, and you promise, hey, you know, God, I'll, you begin to bargain and you promise things. And, and this wasn't like that. This was not that way in any way. When, you know, when I was praying with God during the course of all this, it was never, God, get me out of this. It was, it was never that way. It was, God, I promise I'm going to serve you no matter what. In a prison house, whatever. That's what I prayed. And so, in my head, that's more or less what I was prepared for. And so, then I was given my freedom. So then I began to, then I had to rethink, okay, now what am I going to do? You know? Now I just promised God my life. And I had every intention of following through with that. You know, uh, you know a deal is a deal, and I, I, that's... That's where I, I knew that's what I needed to do. I knew that I wouldn't be happy doing anything less. But I have to just be honest with you. I was maybe just just a little bit of a bad attitude about that whole deal. The, the word that comes to mind is begrudgingly. Begrudgingly is like this. is Parents, you know what I'm talking about. You got a kid, two siblings, and one is not sharing with the other. And, and they says. Johnny, you share with da-da-da. Okay, fine. They do it, but very reluctantly. So I had made a promise to God. And then now that I'm not going to be in prison, now I'm going to be free. Now I've got to stick to it. And so as I'm getting into the Word and, and praying and studying and kind of wrestling with all of those things, because this is, this is some pretty weighty stuff. You know, you're giving your life to the living God. It's not something to be taken lightly. And so I wrestled with that for six months. And, uh, and one thing I did from the very first day was I just picked up my Bible and started in Genesis. And in six months, you know, I read through the Bible. But I had come to this pas passage in, in Joshua, the, the story of the the Gibeon Nights, and, and God just breathed life into it for me, and it just changed everything for me. Uh, because these Gibeon Nights, we, we talk, touched just a little bit on Monday night, we talked about Rahab, right? She lied, she did the wrong thing, but God blessed and honored her for that. The Gibeon Nights, they did a deceitful thing, they did a, a very treacherous thing with Joshua. And the people of God, they lied. And they didn't just lie once, but they lied repeatedly. And they really did some thinking, some forethought with this. But you know what? This is what I gathered out of this passage. It wasn't so much what they did. is They were so desperate to get right with the people of God and their God. They were so scared of what might happen to them. Okay? And Rahab said the same thing. She was terrified. And you know what? This city, Gibeon, they were not just some little city. This, this was an industrial major hub in that area. Uh, the word Gibeon, it means the place of the hill. It was a fortified city on top of a hill. Okay? Some of you war buffs, those are easy to defend. Okay? Uh, I, I did some reading in the 50s. Uh, they excavated this site, and uh, the scientists were looking over the site and the ruins, and they could tell that it had never been destroyed. Mm. So this was a this was a major warring city. Uh, I don't believe they were scared because you know of these people that were at their gates. They were terrified because of their God. Mm. And they were desperate to make peace with this God. And their attitude was, we will do whatever it takes. And sometimes that's all it takes in our lives to get so desperate that we'll do anything. Yes. And I mean anything Amen. to get right Praise with this God. Amen. And see, that's when God begins to honor. And that's when things begin to click and to move into place. Amen. So I could preach all night long on what they did wrong. But I'm going to tell you. They got something right yeah, that day. That's right. Because Joshua, he struck a pact with them. He, he, he made a promise to them, and it was kept. And there was a few things I wanted to mention about these Gibeonites that God honored out of their desperation. 
you know, the, uh, the tabernacle was there for a long time. Yeah. Mm. The tabernacle rested at Gibeon for a long time. Yes. Um, one of David's mighty men was a Gibeonite. Mm. God spoke to Solomon at Gibeon. The Gibeonites were some of the first people that began to rebuild the walls with Nehemiah. I mean, so their, their history is rich with the people of God. I mean, God, I mean, there's no question that maybe God really, maybe just secretly honored them. I mean, he openly brought them in just in the same way Rahab was brought in to the people of God. The Gibeonites were the same way. And you know what? The one thing that God began to really work me over on with this story was when I read this, and see, sometimes our mistake is when we read the word is we don't see ourselves in that situation. We always look at it like that was them. But see, God began to say, this is you. This was you. You deserve destruction. And I'm giving you an opportunity of service. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And what I was wrestling with in my head was, oh, but it's going to be painful. Oh, God, you know, all the high cost. But my God, did you hear what I said? You get to serve the living God. Yes. Amen. When you begin to see what the rewards are, you don't look at the cost. He's going to give you the kingdom. Yeah. Amen. 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 I'm not bound with chains to God. I'm bound by my love for him. It's a totally different story. And I begin to, to, to see myself in this story. And I said, you know what, by God, if I'm going to be a woodcutter, yeah. I'm going to be the best woodcutter for God. Yeah, Amen. 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 And so in that six months that I just devoted myself to him and, and God just radically changed my thinking. It wasn't obligation. It wasn't an obligation in any way. It was an honor. It was an honor to be in his service. And uh, I just wanted to share one more story. I, I love stories. I'm a, a visual person and I love when things are brought to life in stories and video and stuff. And, and this is a, another story that uh, a, a preacher had told and and many of all might have seen it and watched it and stuff. But man, I love it. I, I kid you not, it, it, it makes me cry every time. Hmm. And uh, this preacher, he's he tells his story of this man. Uh, this is like the 1800s. And uh, he went out west and uh, he made his fortunes uh, in the gold rush and, and that whole area. He was coming back. I think he was going to Britain. He was going abroad somewhere. He was coming through uh, New Orleans uh, to catch a ship. And when he was in New Orleans, apparently that was a, a hub of, of slave trade and, and that whole uh, evil thing. And so he's there uh, waiting for a ship, and, uh, and there, there's an auctioneer, and there's a block, and they're auctioning uh, 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 slaves. And there's this one uh, young uh, woman that's up for, uh, for a bid, and the men are bidding feverishly on her. And so... He is in, he's just outraged at this. And so what he does, he steps up and he begins to bid. And he gets into a heated bid with them. And finally, he bids it out just crazy, 10 times higher than anyone's ever bid before for this woman. So he goes up and he pays for it and takes her. And the whole time she's spitting and cussing and she's just, she hates this man. And he drags her and he takes her to this office and she doesn't even realize what's happening here. But she takes, uh, she goes with him and he goes to this office and he buys her manumission papers. And what that basically is, it's a declaration that sets her free. He bought her and then went and paid for her to become free. And then she's still spitting and cussing and doesn't want to have anything to do with them. And finally he hands her her manumission papers papers and she finally registers what happened and then she says you bought me to set me free Amen. you bought me to set me free Amen. and he told he, he told that woman he says you're free to go do whatever you want 
And he and she fell at his feet crying and says, he says, sir, you bought me to set me free. And I can think of nothing else to do but to always be your slave. Wow. Mm. Wow. Come on, wow. And every time, I mean, I've seen it a hundred times. It's a little video to this preacher telling this story. But see, that has made so real to me. See, he bought me with a price. See, it's a little bit more evident in my life, right? Sometimes people don't identify with, you know, I was way out there, this incredible thing. But it's, you don't get it because you're in the same boat. You're in the same place that I was. You know, you've got a sentence hanging over your head. And unless you make peace with that God, destruction is your end. Yes. He's already paid the price. And it's like, it just, it just has to click. And one day it clicked for me. And I know today all I want to do is be his slave. Yeah. And I love that story. I just so love that story. I met your pastor a couple years ago, you know, in Mexico. And what, what, a, what an impact he's had in my life. And, and about a year ago, I kind of came to a crossroads. And I know I was just praying and saying, God, what do I do? You know, we get to God, I need direction. I need something. And, and you know, I just... Kept feeling like God was wanting me in Sugar Land. You know, it's just crazy. And sometimes God tells you something crazy and it's crazy, so you just you don't want to think about it. And, and, but that's what I kept hearing. So finally, I, I went and talked to my pastor about it. And finally, I, I called Eric up and said, Pastor Eric, this man, I've been praying for a long time and I've I really believe I'm supposed to be in your church. Amen. Mm. Yeah. He says, I know. <laughs> and so the rest is history. Amen. You know, I got here as quick as I could. And, yeah, there you go. And hey, hey, thank you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Did his testimony bless you? Yes. yes. Amen. When I met Rick, I did something that I did to a lot of you when I met you. I looked him in the eye and said, so tell me when you fed, fell head over heels in love with Jesus. And I saw, not that he was scared to speak about Jesus. He just met me. He didn't want to tell me that story. He was trying to figure that out. It was like a deer in the headlights for a moment. And that was confusing to me. Y'all know how I am. I mean, what I want to hear is a fantastic, simple story. But the truth is, sometimes our stories are not that simple, are they? And yet, maybe you've never done an illegal drug in your life. Maybe so many of those details don't relate to you in any way. And it is all of our stories. Listen to this verse. When he had come to his senses, come on now. When he had come to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. You may not be hooked on cocaine and maybe you had not broken into anybody's house, but I know you. Some of you are living less than the life that the Father wants you to live. And you don't know how to get back. You don't know how to go where you should go. It's easier to kind of stand, cross your arms, and think about it than it is to do it. Maybe you've even found comfort in the person sitting next to you. If they don't do it, then I don't have to do it either, and at least we'll be miserable together. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. Friends, you put one foot in front of the other. You take the first right step that comes to mind. And your father is watching. And he runs to embrace you. Amen. He didn't make Rick get his life perfect before he met with him. The truth is, Rick's life was far from perfect. And it's still far from perfect, just like mine. 
but he met him right where he was because he saw his intention to return. I'm going to tell you, you had a prophecy during worship today. I have set before you life and I have set before you death. Now choose life. This is the Father's heart that you would find life. If you choose not to put one foot in front of the other, He didn't condemn you. You have condemned yourself. You stand condemned now. That's only funny when you're a stupid teenager. As soon as you have been holding someone's hand and seen them die, as soon as you have been to a funeral of someone that you love and see how final it is, it's no longer funny. Everybody hear me in here, even the teenagers? I'm trying to tell you something. Your father wants you to have life. But he does not make you. And you are not guaranteed. We can sit in our complacency and whine about our lives. Or we can take the first right step. Come on. Some of you have been wallowing in depression. Some of you are looking for an excuse to not take a step. And I'm telling you, if Rick can put one foot in front of the other and find himself in the Father's presence, if this violent young man can put one foot in front of the other and find himself in the Father's presence, all men are without excuse. They're without excuse. I want to encourage you today to put down your excuses. I want to encourage you to find the way. It happens when you put one foot in front of the other. We're going to worship. You can take solace in the fact that someone is sitting next to you and they haven't moved. But I tell you what, no one will be standing next to you on that day. No one. You will be standing eye to eye with your judge. And Rick's judge was fair. What do you fairly deserve? How many times has he held out his arms to you? And you said, I won't be pushed. I won't be moved. <coughs> I don't think it would be funny on that day. We're going to close in song. Some of you will find life. Some of you will continue in death. That choice is up to you. You hear me? It's up to you. You'll never be able to say you didn't hear because this fat old preacher standing in a storefront looked you right in the eye and said, I'm talking to you. If you think I'm not, I'll call you not by name one by one. It's not enough to pray a prayer at an altar. It is not enough to have a warm, fuzzy feeling and get baptized by some limp-wristed preacher. You know what is enough? When you put one foot in front of the other and it never stopped because he was worth it at all costs. Do you think that that woman who was purchased, do you think that she followed him for a few minutes? Do you think that she said, well, now I'm out of trouble, I don't care about him? I bet she was lifelong loyal. Where have you been? Where have you been? Are you lifelong loyal? If you haven't been, put a foot in front of the other. Don't wait for somebody else. Run to the altar. Show yourself to be a person of character. Run to the altar. You're right with the Lord. You're in love with the Lord. That's where your heart is. Ask Him for tomorrow's right step. The last thing you need to do in a place like this is protect your pride. The devil will work to separate you. You'll find a hundred reasons to be offended with me and I'm giving you another one right now. Because those who know their condition will eat through metal to get into the presence of God. Everybody else will simply find an excuse and hell will be full of it. Full of excuses. I got to a place in my life where I would have chewed through concrete because I needed Jesus and I knew it. Nobody could keep me from His presence. Not a person would stand in my way. I sure didn't need an email to be an excuse or somebody's glance at me. or something. I didn't care. I wanted Him. What do you want? Tonight you'll find life for death. That's up to you. This man bared his heart for you. Jesus bore the weight of your sin. He did that for you. Now what you do with him is in your hands. Stand to your feet.